Hey guys, before the video begins, I would like to make a very important announcement in regards to a new channel made by a friend of mine, Kelly Productions. He has created a new channel named The Watch. It's a channel dedicated to making superhero films and miniseries of a new universe that has been created and named The Watch. And the first film is out right now. If you follow me on Twitter, Instagram, or even on this very channel, you know I've spoken about a film that's been involved that I've been involved with. Well, this is it. The Midnight Warden. I'd highly appreciate it if you guys subscribe to this channel, liked the video, turned on notifications, and shared this film with your friends so we can make more films in the future. The more awareness of our films, the more we can make. You can find a link to the channel in the description below of this video, or click on my channel and go to the section channels, and it will be there as we speak. And with that being said, guys, I hope you enjoy today's video. What's going on, everybody? My name is Zell Prince. Welcome back to yet another back video. Now, today I got another SCP video for you guys. This is called Scarier Than the Backrooms? Question mark. SCP-432. Not what it seems. Cabinized maze. Cabinet maze, sorry. And you probably wonder why I'm so far away from the... Far from the tail. It's because I got a cat. Don't leave, my, leave me alone. <laughs> yeah. This is Taz. I don't think I've ever shown her on camera before, but this is Taz. This is not Luna. The oldest one we have in the house. And she decided she wanted to join me for today's video and the last video I recorded. Scratch for it. By Blackamus. But we're not here to talk about that series in today's video because we're not reacting here because I've already reacted to it. But we're here to talk about SCPs and Taz decided to join us today. So... That being said, guys, we're going to get right into this video in three, two, one, go. Think back to your childhood for a moment. When you used to play hide and seek, where was your go-to hiding spot? The one place you knew for sure that no one would ever be able to giant. find you. Outdoors, it might have been inside a garden shed or a garage. Or maybe you had a treehouse where you could lay low as the seekers searched hopelessly for you. Indoors, on the other hand, normally no hiding place can be at a wardrobe closet, or cabinet when it comes to keeping yourself totally undetected. But what if there was a cabinet you could find yourself getting lost in? Something that looks small from the outside but that contains an unknowable amount of interior space within. We call it SCP-432, although some of the researchers have given it the rather adequate nickname of the Cabinet Maze. And it is why you are here, why we at the SCP Foundation have gathered you because you'll be our next expedition inside SCP-432. Uh. Now, before you start to argue, we're not going to send you in there empty-handed. You'll be provided with the standard equipment for a mission like this. Make sure you've got your handheld flashlight with you and enough additional batteries. Your headsets have a microphone that will relay audio back to us at control, and we'll be watching everything through the camera units you will have mounted to your shoulders. You should also take two bottles of water each, and the same in energy bars. We said How many? only two. Don't try to sneak extra. We'll know. Finally, you all need eight sticks of these chalk markers. They're luminous. You're going to be leaving indicators once inside SCP-432, and that will help you navigate your oh, way illumination. Around. Well, they should help. Hopefully. As some of you may have heard, this will not be it's our first SCP expedition Foundation. into SCP-432, and likely won't be our last either. Although it's highly irregular given the complications encountered on our previous missions, we'll be providing you with some select details relating to a few of these aforementioned prior investigations. If you were all paying attention when you were first briefed about this, then you'll already be aware that SCP-432 is a steel storage cabinet, first discovered in an abandoned industrial complex in the United Kingdom. Of course, if that's all it was, then we wouldn't be sending you into it. Yeah. The first expedition into SCP-432 didn't involve a group anywhere near this size. That time, we just sent one D-Class into the cabinet. Once he stepped inside, his camera feed showed us our first recorded look at the interior. From what we could see, the D-Class was standing in a corridor that had been constructed out of the same corroded, rusty metal as the outer cabinet. Following our instructions given via his headset, this D-Class subject, actually let's call him Max, continued down this corridor, turning around a corner a few meters from where he'd entered. Max saw a further, longer tunnel ahead, 
although the poor level of lighting made it impossible to judge just how far it stretched. There was an ordinary electric light bulb illuminating part of this corridor, but not enough to make more than a few short meters visible. By the light of his torch, Max followed this tunnel over 40 meters until it split off in varying directions. Who would have thought that a storage container and an anomalous? What I'm looking for. I can come up with it. Like, it's like one of those little places where it's smaller on the outside, but bigger on the inside. Banding base base itself. Directions, almost like a crossroads of corroded metal. After conferring with control, Max made a mark on the wall nearby, pointing back the way he came, towards the exit. That's an important tip for all of you to remember. Use the equipment we've issued you with in order to find your way back to safety. Well, try to at least, even if it doesn't work. Making his way down the left tunnel, it was at this point that Max's video feed began to degrade in quality. From the safety of the control room, Foundation technicians noted static lines of interference shooting across their monitors. After traversing another 11 meters, Max arrived at a T-junction in the tunnels, and again opted to follow the left path and marked the way back with his chalk. It was after that turn that Max heard… something. The sound didn't make its way back to control due to all the distortion and interference. When they asked him what he had heard, Max waited a moment, listening out for the sound until there it was again. As quietly as he could while still remaining audible, he described the noise. Somewhere off in the distance, further down the rust-coated corridor, someone or something was banging against the metal walls. There were even traces of a voice shouting fearfully into the dark labyrinth. Turning up the audio gain on Max's camera, the Foundation personnel at control could hear it too. Noticeably shaken, the D-Class continued down the corridor in the direction of the banging and shouting, only for him to freeze as he heard a new sound, someone screaming. The other noises had stopped immediately after. Max was getting more and more agitated, demanding to be allowed to leave, but Control urged him to explore further. Arriving at another T-junction, he instead went right this time, once more using his chalk to leave a marker. This is your gentle reminder that you all need to make this a habit when you go inside SCP-432. The right side tunnel of this junction led to a dead end, and doubling back to try the left hand one only ended up yielding the same result. By this point, it had only been 37 minutes since Max had first entered SCP-432, and the Foundation doctor assigned to the cabinet decided this was enough for Expedition 1. Max was recalled, ordered to return to the entrance, and he began doubling back the way he'd come. He stopped at the crossroads, remarking that he'd heard another noise, and Control had picked up on the same thing. This time, it was the sound of the wind. A gentle and breeze was blowing through the tunnel from somewhere deeper within the maze. Max's camera captured a few dead leaves drifting through one of the tunnels he hadn't yet explored. He was commanded to collect the leaves for analysis, much to his disapproval. By this point, he clearly wanted out. As Max followed the order and drew nearer to the uncharted corridor, the deafening sound of a roar echoed through the tunnel, sounding like that of a bear or a lion. In a panic, Max dashed back the way he'd come, directed by the chalk markings he'd left on the walls. Foundation Control demanded that he go back and investigate the source of the roaring, but he was beyond the point of listening now. Desperate to get away from the dark, tangled mass of dimly lit metal tunnels. Screaming as he ran, Max sprinted through the SCP-432 oh, cabinet, collapsing cabinet. from the sheer storage. overwhelming rush Dana. of terror. Now much like the first, Expedition Number 2 only utilized a single member of D-Class to explore more of SCP-432. Obviously, there's only so much ground one person can cover, which is why we've recruited so many of you for the next excursion. Don't worry. We've already run the numbers and calculated just how many of you will make it back in one piece. From the moment the subject of this second outing, who we'll call Carrie, was sent in to SCP-432, her camera feed showed something particularly striking. The interior of the cabinet maze seemed to differ from how it began during Expedition 1. It was as if the extra-dimensional space within the metal storage cupboard had somehow changed itself, reconfiguring into a different layout. Instructed by Control, oh, so Carrie see. walked slowly Ages? down a long, straight corridor, which continued forward for about a hundred meters before splitting into a two-way T-junction. Taking the right-hand route and leaving behind a marker, she proceeded a further fifty meters. 
This time around, the tunnels within SCP-432 were no. illuminated more yeah, frequently by light bulbs, but not quite enough. Love you, Carrie still needed her torch to see a little further into the dark. Right, I gotta go back. She had a marker. She proceeded a further 50 meters. This time around, the tunnels within SCP-432 were illuminated more frequently by light bulbs, but not quite enough. Carrie still needed her torch to see a little further into the darkness. She reached a crossroads, although it lacked any chalk markings, meaning it was not the same as the ones first encountered by Max. Control commanded Carrie to take the left side tunnel after leaving her own marker, and she then followed this new route until hitting a second crossroads. However, acting without orders from the Foundation, Carrie took the right side passageway. Despite admonishment from Control, she was allowed to continue. However, we would advise following any and all instructions put to you for the duration of time that you are inside SCP-432 later on. Ahead of her, Carrie's torchlight showed there to be a third crossroads, but something caused her to stop before she got closer. She reported the noise of a rhythmic banging that reverberated through the rusted metal walls of the labyrinth. Staying perfectly still, trying to keep her breathing low and quiet, Carrie nervously asked about what SCP-432 really was, and where that ominous sound was coming from. Naturally, Foundation Control did not provide any answers. As Carrie delved further into the labyrinth, her camera feed showed a number of the light bulbs in this corridor had been shattered, leaving shards of glass on the metal floor. Additionally, she noted that there was an unpleasant, stomach-churning odor in the air that smelled like something dead. Carrie noticed an object a few meters later, Jesus. although her All camera right, feed on, guys, to cut in. Alright, I'm back, and Taz has... Most part, she might come back. Anyway, let's continue. ...in and out, as she knelt down to examine what it was. She reported it was a sports sneaker, but as her camera refocused on the abandoned footwear, the feed suddenly yeah. shifted angles, tilting down towards the All floor right, come on up. that was covered in blood. Carrie hadn't realized what it was at first. There was a layer of a dry brown substance on the corridor floor flaking off in places. Looking up under the light of her torch, Carrie Fantastic. noticed even more had been over the walls, although it must have been some time ago given how the blood had long started to dry out and crack. But that did little to make her feel comfortable at the sight of a long smear trailing away up the corridor. Despite her continued complaints about the sickening, decaying smell, control is it an actual entity, or is it just a space, and the space itself is possessed? Just clean this shirt, Ted. <laughs> On. Will instructed Carrie to collect the shoe and samples of the dried blood for testing. She asked to be let out of SCP-432, but Foundation personnel denied her request, telling her to continue further down the corridor which she did at a much slower, more reluctant pace. It was only when her video and audio feed started to suffer heavy interference that Control told her to return. By now, Carrie was panicking, saying she could hear footsteps behind one of the walls and made her way back out at a far quicker speed. For security reasons, details pertaining to the Foundation's third SCP-432 expedition cannot be shared with you all. Don't worry, we can still provide you with information about the fourth and fifth attempts before you end up heading into the cabinet maze yourselves. In a departure Wait, from in the, the initial expedition? two, the fourth of our expeditions was featured a was team it of three personnel. Two from D-Class, who will be referred to as Leo and Jade, and one SCP Foundation Technical Assistant, Kay. We aren't currently planning on sending any more of our own ranks into SCP-432, so when you venture in, you'll only have each other for company. Plus whatever else is inside the labyrinth. Some of the standard exploration equipment was divided up amongst the group, with only Leo given the luminous chalk markers, as well as a pry bar. Really, Taz? Yeah, she will, is not leaving me alone. And I had to change shirts because my other shirt was not, was completely covered in hair. And that was at the start of the video. <laughs> you were in such a lovely, lovely mood, but you won't leave me alone. She's on my... Here again. Right here. <laughs> it's not like, going anywhere right now. All right, well, anyway, let's continue. Plus, whatever else is inside the labyrinth. Some of the standard exploration equipment was divided up amongst the group, with only Leo given the luminous chalk markers, as well as a pry bar. Jade was the only member given a shoulder-mounted video unit, and for their own safety, Kay was issued with a firearm. 
The primary objective of this exploration of SCP-432 was to use an oxidiline cutting torch, operated by K, to cut through the corroded metal walls of the corridors within. Venturing and San team made their way try along and see a series what the heck of is on the other side and see what's making the bank. You good? What is up with you right now? You just jumped all over my keyboard. Why are you doing that? Come here. You're making this video a lot longer than it needs to be, Taz. ...of turns that Foundation Control chose at random. They arrived at a crossroads, immediately noticing something that hadn't been present during the earlier expeditions. The northmost passageway of the crossroads had two large steel pipes attached to the walls, almost like those found in factories or other industrial settings. Upon receiving a message from Control to examine the pipes, Kay remarked that the metalwork was cold to the touch, seemingly with liquid passing through them, as if these were some form of plumbing system. Kay requested to cut the pipes open using the blowtorch, but Control denied and instructed the groups to follow them instead. They did so for around 300 meters, only to find the pipes continued through a wall that blocked the team's path. Under orders to do so, Kay ignited the oxetylene torch and began attempting to cut through the metal surface that stood like a dead end in their way. It was at that point that Jade reported hearing something behind them, although a sweep of her camera showed the corridor was empty, or, at the very least, it appeared to be empty. Having made a few cuts into the metal wall, Kay then allowed Leo to use his pry bar to try and lever a section of it open to allow the group a way to climb through. The moment he did, a loud roar was heard coming from behind the wall. The terrifying animalistic sound caused Jade to scream, backing away in fear, only for something on the other side of the metal to punch at the blow-torched wall with enough force to bend its rusted surface outwards. Oh, wow. The video feed from Jade's camera unit began to sporadically cut in and out, along with the audio. But what did come through were clear sounds of a struggle, violent roaring and gunfire from Kay's sidearm, along with screaming from all three members of the expedition team. <laughs> There was something else inside the cabinet maze, some indigenous life form that roamed the long, dark metal corridors that was attacking the latest three to venture inside. Only Jade made it back to the entrance of the labyrinth by following the chalk markers the group had been leaving on the walls along the way. It is because of how effective this practice is that we've been encouraging you to make sure you do the same once inside SCP-432. By the time this D-Class returned, she was in clear state of complete and utter distress, as well as being severely injured. She was covered in blood, not all of it her own. Neither Jade's fellow D-Class, Leo, nor Foundation Technical Assistant K made it back. The personnel waiting outside the rusty cabinet had to shut SCP-432 after Jade emerged in order to prevent whatever creature was inside from escaping. When they reopened the doors after enough time had elapsed, the interior corridors of SCP-432 had reconfigured themselves again, meaning the other two members of Expedition 4 were lost. As for D-Class member D-8321, she was terminated shortly after being debriefed. What was perhaps okay. most curious about this, though, was that Foundation- I forget that the SCP Foundation has absolutely no chill, but why terminate her? Could have sent her in again personnel found a large tuft of brown animal hair had been caught in her equipment harness, presumably during the attack. The hair smelt notably unpleasant, but analysis showed that it belonged to a known family of animal. However, there was also a number of notable irregularities within its DNA. Now that brings us on to Expedition Number 5. In a return to form only a single member of D-Class, we'll call him Mike, was sent into SCP-432 this time. Though naturally, during your expedition, there will be a few more of you making your way through these corridors. Possibly the most noticeable difference between this excursion and all of those that had previously been conducted was that now no light was being emitted within the corroded metal tunnels. All, all the light bulbs on. that had once offered at least a low level of visibility were now smashed, with Mike noticing there was a substantial amount of broken glass littering the floor. Perhaps the creature in there got bored and broke them all, or maybe it wanted the advantage of no one being able to see it. Guided by the instructions Control was issuing, Mike followed a short corridor about 10 meters along, before stopping at the first of the T-junctions that seemed to regularly occur within the cabinet maze. Making a left as Control told him to, Mike kept his torch on, 
pointing ahead of him to alleviate some of the dark. Following and marking each turn that Control instructed that he take, much like all the previous expeditions, Mike reported hearing strange noises coming from within the labyrinth. He described the sound of machinery emanating from some distant part of the maze, okay, that's as new. well as feeling cold. All the bulbs were still broken, and not one that he came into contact with provided any light. Taking a break to drink some water and recharge his energy with a ration bar, Mike had reached almost two and a half thousand meters into SCP-432. Oh my god, Taz. Ah, uh, the hair started to get to me. Making it deeper into the cabinet maze than anyone previously had. Well, a member of personnel, anyway. The reason we say this is because Mike soon discovered signs that someone else might have been hiding within the labyrinth. He noticed a few old crumpled tin cans and a bent fork that had been used to eat their contents. Whoever else was that deep inside of SCP-432 would likely still not be alive, especially with the creature lurking in the corridors. Yeah. Although if they were, perhaps it was them who broke all the lights to keep themselves hidden. Soon after, Mike overheard the sound of a man sobbing coming from somewhere close by. Although Control struggled to hear the same, they instructed Mike to follow the noise of the crying and locate the person responsible. Chasing through the dark towards whoever it was, Mike could hardly see a thing, even with his torch as a light source. Hello? Can you hear me? I'm, I'm coming! He cried, trying to get the attention of the weeping man. Instantly, a Foundation Control technician in his earpiece told Mike not to raise his voice, reapproaching the D-Class and warning that he could draw attention to himself. When Mike retorted by asking what else was down in the corridors of SCP-432, no further answer was provided. He paused at the next junction, where the tunnels intersected, hey. hearing a long, yeah. drawn-out moaning sound. Possibly a scream. A human scream. The crying stopped immediately Come after. On. Mike asked Control if they had picked up the sound, stating that it seemed to have come from somewhere nearby. Once again, Control urged him to continue further into the labyrinth, although now Mike was trying to move as slowly and stealthily as he possibly could. Turning a right about 20 meters further down, Mike's camera feed showed that he had reached yet another dead end. The maze blocked his way forward. Leaning his ear close to the metal, Mike listened for any further signs of life, only to recoil at what he heard beyond the blocked corridor. Crunching, the noise of bones being broken, and something, someone, being eaten by the life form that resides within SCP-432. Control urged Mike to get out of there, and he complied, although not without checking over his shoulder the whole walk back. At present, we still don't have an accurate description of the creature. Some theories state that it might be imprisoned inside SCP-432. Others suggest that it guards the labyrinth within and protects it from trespassers and interlopers. As for how other human beings, or their remains at least, have been uncovered within the cabinet maze, well, a number of homeless people have been reported missing from the industrial complex where SCP-432 was first uncovered. Presumably, some of them used that area for shelter, and some ended up inside the cabinet. Of course, our current objective is to learn this video has gone on a lot longer than it should because it has keeps interrupting me. Learn more about the creature. On, this is where you all come in. So now that we've covered the previous expeditions into SCP-432, if there are no further questions, we'd like you all to walk right this way. What are you waiting for? Step inside the cabinet. Of course we'll let you back out afterwards. Now go and check out SCP-3333 Tower right. and SCP-5140 Frozen Bodies on Everest are alive. For more anomalous areas, you really shouldn't try to explore yourself. All right. With that being said, guys, I hope you guys did enjoy this react video. I tried to listen a lot and try and understand as much as I could throughout that entire video, but Taz kept distracting me. She kept jumping on me. She kept go comment on things. She never does this. But I hope you guys did enjoy today's react video. Please like and subscribe, also, guys, and I will. You. Next video. Hi.